Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Hey. Taisha Tyler. The Tribe Called Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz. Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim, and you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Ow! Hello, and welcome to the Talk House Podcast. I'm Josh Modell. On this week's episode, we've got a pair of musicians who both suffer from the effects of LSD. That's lead singer disease. Stuart Murdoch and Ramesh Srivastava. Ramesh was, and now is again, the lead singer and chief creative force behind the Austin, Texas band Voxtrot, which burned bright but maybe too quick in the early 2000s. They released a series of rapturously received EPs and one LP that were beloved by fans of deeply British institutions like Sarah Records and The Smiths. But the band had split by 2010, and Ramesh went on to release a pair of solo albums that didn't quite have the impact his band did. For a while, he was content to leave Voxtrot in the past, but gathering material for two reissues gave him the spark to get things going again. The next few months, we'll see the release of both Early Music, which gathers the band's beloved EPs, and Cut from the Stone, which features rarities and b-sides. And then, like some unstoppable force of nature, Voxtrot will tour the U.S. again. Dates can be found at voxtrot.net. And in case you're not familiar, here's a bit of a great Voxtrot song called The Start of Something. Do you hear a bit of Bell and Sebastian in that song? They're a pretty clear influence on Voxtrot, and Srivastava met Stuart Murdoch while living in Glasgow in his younger days. You'll hear about their meet-cute in this conversation. Bell and Sebastian, of course, have had an incredible career over the past quarter century or so. They started life as a school project for Murdoch, a shy young man whose feelings spilled out into his gentle songs in a way that seemed then, and now, to be almost magical. Over the years, Bell and Sebastian developed from a sort of bedroom pop project to a massive pop machine, while never losing that spirit of playfulness and sincerity that Murdoch has always projected. The band recently released their ninth studio album, called A Bit of Previous. The title is a bit tricky in that it seems to reference the good old days, but also Murdoch's longtime interest in Buddhism, which he explored in greater depth during the pandemic. In this conversation, you'll actually hear a bit about how both Ramesh and Stuart approach spirituality, both Christianity and Buddhism. You'll hear how being a, quote, gay brown person pushed Ramesh away from religion for a long time. They talk about the aforementioned lead singer disease and how that affects everyday life for them. And we get to hear about a young Stuart Murdoch making his way to the London flat of one of his musical heroes, but then deciding not to actually knock on the door. Enjoy. I guess we should introduce ourselves. Um, hey, this is Stuart Murdoch from Bell and Sebastian. This is Ramesh Srivastava, again now from Voxtrot, after 12 years of not being from Voxtrot. But as of today, at 3 p.m., we will have our first Voxtrot practice in 12 years. <laughs> so it's going to be a blast from the past. I can see you having an existential crisis right in front of me slightly. Are you <laughs> looking forward to it? Uh, yes, I'm looking forward to it. But there's an issue that you can't get away from that's constantly with you, that's sort of like always churning. Basically, the question of whether this Voxtrot thing will be the beginning of a second chapter or whether it's going to be the final goodbye is just this thing that I turn over and over constantly. Six months ago, I would have had zero hope, or or I would have had zero desire, actually, that it would be a second chapter. Like, I felt really firm in the fact that I'm now a solo artist and I've just put out a second solo record and that that's the obvious direction that it's going. But then once the Voxtrot thing really picked up in terms of gathering all the material and just all the plan making, like once it became really real, I just started to go down this other road in my mind where I could see like, oh my gosh, like there's this whole history and there's all this material and as you start to announce stuff and see the fan interaction you're like there's just this great relationship with this fan base and it's like so sweet and I would think why would we not continue with that I want a psychic to tell me what's going to happen 
Well, the good thing is, I assume that you're you're still kind of driving the bus on the on the project. Somebody didn't come in and give you like a three album, ten year contract and and right. and say you must fulfill this. Yeah, yeah. You, you you can feel it out. You can see where it's going. Yeah, I am driving the bus. That's true, but. It kind of feels like I'm not, but if it's not like I'm not, but one of the other band members is, it feels like I'm not, but fate is. Yeah. Well, that's nice. Yeah. You know, that thing of like, like if you start dating somebody and you don't know, you feel like, yes, this is obviously a connection. Like something's definitely happening and you invest a lot of hope in it. Sometimes that is true, that you're perceiving it exactly as the other person is, that that thing you're picking up on is really mutual energy. But sometimes it turns out that actually it's just a desire within you and you're projecting it onto them and it's not the same. I've been studying a little bit of Buddhism recently and the mutual energy thing doesn't really crop up so much as the (laughs) the individual perception is the big one. Your mind is a tricky thing. Yeah. It can it can paint the, the kind of picture you want it to paint. So yeah. sometimes, but that feeling about feeling that it is the right thing, I think is a very valid feeling. You know, that feeling uh, sometimes, I, I'm not even so sure if that is very Buddhist, but I, I certainly go by that. You, you know, you're, you're feeling that something is the right thing. It feels, sometimes it is the path, the path of least resistance right. that, that takes you to the good place. Yes, that totally. But then that thing of feeling it's the right thing, I think I can almost always detect that. And I guess if you're listening, you can't see that I'm pointing to my <laughs> sternum. I'm pointing to my heart, even though we all know a heart's not actually there, but I'm uh, pointing to the center of my chest. I, I feel like I can always feel that right thing sort of, yeah, directly in the center of me, like a little tiny guiding compass and sometimes and probably most times it is the path of least resistance but there are some times when it is a really difficult decision that you know is going to lead to a certain amount of upheaval or like conflict that you don't really want to face yeah but you feel it as the guiding thing inside of you and it's sort of like this idea that i've read uh in certain books that the truth always makes things simpler it doesn't always make it easier, but it always makes things simpler. That's good. I agree with you that the right thing, the thing that you have to do, isn't necessarily the easiest thing. Usually, when it involves other people, I know. That's, what I was <laughs> that's the, you know, that's the key thing. Is we're, we aren't just islands, and other people come along. Something happens, and and you sometimes go, okay, this is yeah. going to be tricky, but I have to do it. Yeah, for sure. Are there specific examples you can think of? Band, kids, <laughs> yeah, <it's> like, <laughs> marriage. It's like, I think I know family. all of them. But, right? <laughs> yeah, just, you know, that, that sort of stuff. Yeah, that's the, mind you, you know, let, let's admit it. We're, we're both singers. We're, we're both creative people in bands. And, and we were the creators of this, yeah. this initiative. In a sense, that's um, a fairyland. You know, it's a, in a nice way. It's, yeah. you know, what we do is, is, um, is fun land, you know, adventure land. If you're in that position, you know, this is your world. And, and, and in a sense, you're, you're, you're driving the bus and, and you're always moving towards something you love, yeah. the creativity. And it's a, it's a boon and it's a, it just makes up for a lot of bad things in life. It's a good thing. You're, you're going towards a golden window of creativity. Yeah. So if the rest of the stuff in life seems a little bit more jaggy then that's because it is and that that we you know we all deserve a dose of uh, reality yeah it's true (laughs) (laughs) well my friend greg who is also a lead singer in a band or was in some bands in the 90s he calls it lsd lead singer's disease (laughs) 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 It's, it's like you have like a completely distorted concept of how things work because in your professional life, you're sort of always in the center. Oh, uh, yeah. So you think of it like, well, you think of it like things are orbiting around you because to an extent they are. Yeah. But that becomes the delusion is that I always think of, uh, have you ever heard of the Enneagram? No. The nine pointed system that it's not a personality thing like a Myers-Briggs type indicator, which is the Jungian thing. It has to do with what you were valued for as a child that made you feel good and useful in the world. 
And so as you grow up, you tend to sort of like turn into this version of yourself that has this outward facing personality that is the thing you were valued for because that's what you think you have to do All right, okay, to yeah. survive in life and to be loved. Sure. So the sense of value comes from performing and achieving. Yeah. And uh, the good access of that, of course, is that you can achieve really great things. Yeah. And then the negative access, of course, is that you can become really self-involved. It's when it becomes all about you that you're sort of stuck in your personality. You don't see the grander reality of life. But the path of growth is to work in a scenario where you are not necessarily at the center. Like a good exercise would be to volunteer somewhere where it's not about you at all. Or like in my case, I feel like my job at the restaurant, even though there are times when I'm like angry that I have to work outside of music or when I was earlier or last year teaching for kids with reading difficulties, it's like I have so much resistance to it. But when I'm in that environment where it's all about me having to cooperate, I become more aware of the fact that everything, even Voxtrot or any musical endeavor I'm doing, happens only as the result of the cooperation between all these people and all of these forces that are, of course, inexplicable, like how many things come together yeah. to make any one thing happen. You can't do you can't do anything without other people helping you. Yeah, really. And you and uh, sorry to keep going back to Buddhism, but you can't. The teachers are always telling me, you look basically everything you've been given has been given to you by another person. That's oh, something wow. that you just you just take for granted. You know everything. I love the that LSD, the lead singer. <laughs> disease yeah it reminds me there was a show called 30 rock yeah and john ham came on the show for like one or two oh, episodes yeah. or something like that and tina fey she realized that he was in a bubble that because he was so good looking that everything just all these doors just opened to him and he didn't have the hassles of everyday life and she tried to explain to him about the bubble but he was he was <laughs> <laughs> so maybe to an extent and and you know and on tour as well like for instance a small example i lost my um laminate my pass mm -hmm. for the tour within about three days of getting it and stevie dreads our tour manager gave me another laminate somebody else on the tour got into trouble and got fined <laughs> for, oh, really? because apparently <laughs> losing your lab and it's like really bad you know it's a security thing and yeah. you should really look after it and you know you get you get find a day's pds uh for oh really wow. yeah for for losing your laminate where i but <laughs> i was i was in the lead singer bubble that's really <laughs> so, funny <laughs> yeah so um, maybe i need to have a talk with myself <laughs> <laughs> but then then again we were talking about this adventure land that the lead, <laughs> the yeah. lead singers are in or the artists are in but you've got your job still yeah and i've got my family yeah and that's a you know that's a big dose of something else yeah and when i go home i am at the lowest rung right. of the ladder you're just of service essentially yeah. well daddy it's just you know they they just want their mom all the time and i'm just on the the, the kind of fringes right. and <laughs> uh, pretty low down but that's that's cool yeah do you think without it, without something that is like the grounding, foundational, humbling thing, without it, it would just be easy to get lost? I think so. Human beings are completely shaped by the things that happen to them. If people went on without troubles, without they, they would probably just be unsufferable wankers. Uh -huh. You know, if bad things didn't happen to them sometime to, to make them realize about the sufferings of other people... Then right. they, you know, they would they would be completely clueless. Yes, that's true. I mean, some people do have natural empathy and compassion, and maybe that's a karma thing, you know. But I think on the whole, we are shaped by events, by suffering specifically. Yeah. yeah. If we didn't have our troubles, what would we write about? Would we even exist as artists? I never wrote a song before. Bad things happen to me. Yes, that's true. I guess it does open you up essentially yeah and i i guess it's funny that i that i'm even posing it as a question like if you didn't have the grounding thing would you get lost because actually i feel like i got completely lost towards the end of voxtrot when it first sort of dissolved in 2008 2009 and i actually don't feel like i felt sort of grounded again until like maybe four years ago or something so i guess i was lost for a long time because i think towards the when voxtrot was starting to come apart, so to speak. I just couldn't conceive of how I could exist as a human being if I weren't special or famous like that. It seemed impossible to me. 
it took a while to either figure out or to become peaceful with it. It took multiple years after that to figure out, I guess the simplest way I can put it, to figure out that it wasn't a matter, sounds so reductive and cheesy maybe, but that it wasn't a matter of that I need to get something back from the outside that I'd lost so that I could feel valuable again. That it was actually, of course, a matter of needing to discover something inside so that I could feel valuable again, or maybe for the first time. I don't know. I don't know if I ever felt truly kind of whole within myself. I don't even, wouldn't even say now that I'm 100% there. That's it. I'm complete, but definitely way more than before. But I think that might be common just for much younger people anyway. Well, remind me what age you were when Foxtrot came together. 18. Yeah. <laughs> so That's a lot of I don't mean to be condescending, but, yeah. you know, when I was 18, I was a basket case. Right. I didn't know. I could go to the shops. Right. You know? <laughs> and you're starting a band. And, and, and of course, it may be you get a lot out of it, but I'm assuming that, that in time, Foxtrot wasn't, it, it didn't complete your life. Right. You're saying that I thought it would and that the result well, is that it didn't? I guess we always think that the, yeah. the next thing's going to complete our life. And, For sure. It didn't. And it, well, it didn't. And also, I guess for years afterward, I blamed myself and thought if I'd played the cards differently, then the band trajectory of success would have continued going up and it would have completed my life. That's actually the thought pattern I had for many years, which now I realize is simply not true and is not a good way to look at it because obviously you can look at many artists or bands who become and remain hugely successful, but who have a lot of psychological issues and a lot of uh, yeah. kind of tragic trajectories. So I think it's invariably true that it can never complete your life. Uh, yeah, you get the, the rare people like David Bowie, or Johnny Mitchell, Prince, who just, yeah. you get on the path, stay on the path. Yeah. These amazing artists who change like chameleons or, huh. you know, yeah. and how rare is that? You know, it's yeah. not, the, these are kind of, I guess in the back of our minds, sometimes we have these shining examples and we think, well, I'll just be another Joni Mitchell. Right, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Um, but it doesn't, no, life isn't simple like that. It's, yeah. we got to take the, the twists and the turns. Do you think that those artists, uh, like obviously they continue to grow and change artistically from your knowledge or sense of them. Do you feel like though, that they also felt like truly at peace inside? It's kind of hard to figure out. Yeah. I think they had a, probably as bumpy a road as any of us. I think maybe the, you were talking about slightly different things because crucially the three of them had the confidence to be solo artists from the get-go to steer their own destiny to have that confidence knowing they had this flood of creativity coming through them that they needed to express you know bands are a different thing we like to well I don't know about you but I always wanted to dress up I wanted to cloak myself with a band I guess I hadn't thought about that before like I guess well as somebody who has now released two solo albums like what it really, yeah, exactly, how much confidence it really takes to really pull that off solo and, like, thinking, you know, like, coming out of a band, me thinking, like, yes, I definitely have that much confidence, but then you see, like, it's really hard. It's really, really hard. So you're right. It is very impressive. Yeah. I think maybe we take our bands for granted. Well, I I probably do from time to time, but I do appreciate it. It is like being in a, in a family, and if you want to kind of hide a little bit, it's okay. It must have been quite a brave thing to suddenly announce a solo career. What did you find the main differences were? Uh, I thought the reception would be different. I thought that coming from a semi-well-known band, that all the doors would open. But it was not really like that. You know, and I, of course, know as a music fan myself that when a band I love, if the singer goes solo... There's just something about it that is, like, not appealing. <laughs> There's something about it that you feel like you just don't care somehow. On one hand, I had, like, like a lot of support. and I did this Kickstarter campaign, and people really came together, and a lot of people contributed, and there was a lot of great energy, and it was, like, that was really heartwarming, actually. But in terms of, like, trying to get, like, a proper career, sustainable career going with it, it was much harder than I thought. I definitely thought that I could sort of ride off of the energy that I had from Voxtrot. And it isn't really like that. It actually felt, even though I know it's not really starting from zero, it felt sort of like starting from zero. Yeah. 
and and even just the economics what can i afford to do next right. you know who, yeah. <laughs> can i afford to bring in this other person to play with me and what's going to happen in this concert and all that stuff right yeah it definitely that's well that becomes an everyday occurrence even in a band you know like right. stuff like that and when stevie jackson you know he he, he tried that because we had a break and he was he made a, a lovely solo album but if he found those difficulties as yeah. well i don't think he was presuming that much he wasn't launching his solo career but he did right. he, he did a, a, a bunch of concerts and we you know we we were all thinking well that record deserved to be better yeah. list, listened to than it was yeah. they say it's cold out there <laughs> <laughs> One question I do have written down that I'm curious about is now I know you've been doing these meditations on the, I guess, as podcasts or as, well, somehow transmitted yeah, transmitted. through the internet, <laughs> through the world of social media. How did you come to meditation or has that always been a thing for you? So I did start, I did meditate like 30 years ago. I've been kind of doing it on and off. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Head of the curve. Head of the curve, <laughs> yeah. But I, it went along with the thing that happened to me. I got ill. You know, my, when I first met you, I was still, you know, that was in 2000. But it, I, I got ill actually at the end of the 80s with chronic fatigue yeah. syndrome. And, and that was before the band and before everything. And so one of the things when I, uh, when I started to pick up a little bit, you know, I definitely had a spiritual life and I was interested in different things. I started going to church, uh, you know, Christian church, but also I started going to the local Buddhist center oh. for, for meditation. And that, but that was meditation in the sense of simply, you know, about the mind and calming the mind, mm -hmm. not so much learning about Buddhism, but it was, it was fun. I liked it. You know, it, definitely, it was definitely a thing. But it was actually when um, when I had my first kid for somebody with a good, healthy dose of lead singer disease. <laughs> the child was, you know, the child was hard. Yeah. Uh, you know, having to, to look after somebody else so completely. Um, and at that point, I, I, I was... I said to my wife, I need, so I need something else. I, so I went back to, I thought, well, I'm going to get back into the meditation with a vengeance. And, and I went to the, a different Buddhist center, but they were actually, while we were doing meditation, they were actually teaching Buddhism at the same time. Mm -hmm. They were, and I was so grateful for that because wow. it was amazing. And this is somebody who's, who was solidly had been going to church for, you know, I'm a, an elder in the church, for God's sake. <laughs> in which, in the Christian church? Yeah, in, the, in a regular Christian Protestant church, you know, and, uh, but I, I took up with the Buddhists and mm. I, and nothing about it contradicted my Christianity. Right. I find it was a beautiful yin and yang thing where it, 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 it was looking at things from another perspective and, and really breaking things down, mm -hmm. talking about the mind and feelings. And uh, so I, I, I was just kind of addicted to, to it, that, so that was like seven or eight years ago, and oh. um, so that became a big thing. And when when the so when the pandemic started, uh, you know, being a again a person lead singer disease, you know, a performer, right. always wanting to broadcast <laughs> and talk, it seemed the natural thing to to want to take uh, my limited knowledge and try to share it. Uh, because we were all shut down, yeah, and uh, so that's why I started doing the little little sessions yeah and have people been really responsive yeah totally Amazing. i mean at the start it was busy because nobody had anything to do you know mm -hmm. people were kind of ch checking things out and but over the time i only just stopped doing the regular sunday evening since we came on tour mm -hmm. and uh, i have a you know there's a core of people that always uh you know check in and it's great because they you know i'm in gmt and they they, they check in from mexico and it's, they're just getting up in mexico they're just going to bed in japan and you know wow. and we're all you know meditating online yeah that's awesome <laughs> it's good i've recently been very curious about the the intersection between things like christianity and buddhism i guess you could say between all the religions but it's sort of like I, as a person who was raised here in Austin, Texas, but I went to this kind of rural school, which in the 80s and 90s was a pretty tough, conservative place. I think it's a little lighter now, but at that time, for me as a gay brown person, was pretty scary. But it's a lot of uh, very, very conservative Christianity going wow, on. Wow, right. So growing up, 
of course, my I'm half Indian, so my dad is from India. My mom is American. At that time, she was not religious, so we didn't have we didn't have a Christian household. We didn't even have a religious household, really. But everybody I was around, most people were very religious. And if I would sleep over at a friend's house on a Saturday, I'd always end up in church right, with their okay. family the next day. But it's usually a Baptist church. <laughs> right. So it was like very, very wild to me. Yeah. And then once I became a teenager and realized that I was gay, I mean, I was beforehand, I wouldn't really think much about it. We go to church with the family. It would be like, I don't know, just an experience. I wasn't really taking stock. But once I realized I was gay, then I kind of developed this this thing where I was kind of against it. Like I felt like it was my enemy. And that lasted through most of high school. I would have said I'm just like a staunch atheist. That's it. And then I think that continued actually probably till I don't think I thought about spirituality at all, like all the way almost through my 20s. It wasn't until then, I guess, when I started, when Voxtrot fell apart, and then I started having, yeah, basically this prolonged existential crisis, that then I began wondering about it. And then I started going down all these uh, rabbit holes of investigation, trying to figure it out. And I would go through periods of, like, I read the Bhagavad Gita and I was like, oh, I'm, <laughs> like, this makes total sense. Like, I'm a Hindu, which makes sense because I'm half Indian. Yeah, yeah. So this was always meant to be. And then then I would start, like, hearing people talk about Jesus and I would think, am I a Christian? I don't know. Like, I knew I used to be really against that, but is that the plot of my life that I am that? And then I kind of, I figured out that that wasn't really it. And I kind of now am at this point where it, it almost feels like behind all the religions, there must be a single unifying truth. Like, it seems to me that I was thinking about it the other day, kind of thinking about this, this history I've had with religion and embracing it and rejecting it and wrestling with it. And I was thinking, I was like, wow, I, for example, don't even know historically, thinking about the death of Jesus. I was like, I don't even know who killed Jesus. And yet I have this idea about Christianity as a thing, but it's more based on an experience that I've had growing up than it is to do with the actual thing. It's like, I know that there's something. I know there is a deep mystery of existence. I know there's something, but I don't know what it is. But I know that behind all of these different systems of thought, or it feels to me like there's got to be one thing. Yeah, that, that's perfect. See, the, the way you said there's a deep mystery of existence. It, you know, that to me, that's a, a perfect way of describing it. And everybody's got to work it out for themselves. That's where I think the Christian church does go wrong. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, because everybody's got to work it. I almost think that the Christian church has a PR problem. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's what the, the Buddhism, the, the, as far as I can see, the Buddhists in, in Glasgow were saying, they always said, come in, come to meditate. You don't have to believe anything we say, work it out for yourself. Go back to first principles. Use your mind. What do you think? What do you feel? You don't have to believe anything. This is, we're just we're doing a scientific thing here. We're just talking about the mind. We're just, mm -hmm. and then they would you know they would introduce Buddhist concepts, which were all you know we're we're based in everyday life and we're easy to. Whereas it sometimes feels, and I've always felt this. I mean, you know, my my personal faith led me to go to a Christian church, and it but that it was not usual for somebody to just cross the threshold. But for somebody to cross the threshold, it's almost like you're, you, they maybe expect you to believe a certain thing and to maybe already be in the club. Right. And I, they shouldn't expect that. And I hid in that church for 20 years. I hid in that church not being a fully-fledged Christian, but knowing there was a deeper mystery and kind of knowing that this was the place for me. I love the people there... I had a good feeling about it. But at the same time, I was still an outsider because I didn't believe this, 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 and this. Yeah. So, I mean, and that's me. And, I, you know, it, for I, for all the folks that were around me, um, not believing, not interested, uh, I, I got it. I totally got it. Right. And, uh, you know, everyone, the cat's out the bag. Look at us. There's seven, eight billion people on the right. planet. We all believe different things. There's many, yeah. many religions. There's a deep mystery somewhere. <laughs> yeah. But we should be accepting of everybody's yes. mystery. 
And, <clears throat> and to an extent, through, through the band, I've been wrestling with this, uh, you know, not necessarily problem, but this uh -huh. situation um, about spirituality in everyday life, what it means to people. And, and uh, you know, if you're different mm -hmm. uh, and you don't seem to fit in, then what's for you? Right. You know, why can't, why can't a gay person have a spiritual life? Of course yeah. they can. They are, are, they are as uh, deserving of it as anybody else. Yeah. But, but why is this not talked about so much? You know, we, we made a couple of records in, in, in L.A. And mm -hmm. uh, on the, the first day when we were staying there, I walked to the nearest church, but it happened to be the gayest church in Christendom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, back then, they were called West Hollywood Presbyterian. They called something else. Now, and I still pop in there, you know, when oh, I'm amazing. in Los Angeles. And yeah. that, it is amazing. Yeah. You know, uh, it's affirming. Yeah. I would say, like, homosexuality seemed like one of the biggest barriers to... Yeah, I guess basically all religions. I thought of religion as the only gateway to spirituality. It seemed like homosexuality was then a barrier to spirituality in general. Have you ever heard of this author named John Bradshaw? He was an Episcopal priest. And before he kind of woke up, essentially, he had a really bad drinking problem. Like crazy alcoholic, I think. And then he got clean and had like this, a lot of just series of kind of realizations and he wrote this book called healing the shame that binds you and it's an amazing book i anybody listening i would say like even if you don't think you have any problems you should read that book <laughs> because it totally it made me see differently i think i started reading it the first day that the world went into lockdown because i just started therapy with this amazing guy that lives he's in arizona but he's sort of they have he and his partner have this kind of therapy empire and it's this incredible enlightened thing called the learning love institute and they have a reading list and the second we went into lockdown i was like well here we go so i <laughs> so i went to the reading list i started at the top which was this healing the shame that binds you was the first book and it really just blew my worldview open in terms of like of course i know what the word shame means and have always for in living memory, know what that means, but did not see like how how shame is a thing that that is informing our actions in ways that we're not necessarily conscious of. And then reading this book and starting to see all of the ways that he lists that it kind of manifests in your life, that it's really a powerful thing. The reason I was talking about that is his definition of spirituality in the book is just simply an inner life. And when I read that, something really clicked inside of me. And I thought, yes, like that is what it is, is it is to do with the relationship to yourself. Because at this weird, crazy, abstract level, as they talk about in the Bhagavad Gita, that your yourself, which of course can be the self with the capital S, yourself kind of is the whole world. Like all you have are your five senses and yeah, everything's just coming in as information and you just trust that this is reality and it's just whatever is in your consciousness. You know that there are these things in the world and in the universe, but everything is just information and sensations happening through you as a being. So it's kind of like your relationship to yourself is like your relationship to all of existence. Absolutely. I love that. Just breaking it down to just your inner life. Yeah. Inner life is sacred. Everybody's inner life is as important as anybody else's. It's nice that people can get to realize that whoever you are, wherever you are, your inner life can really work for you as well. Yeah. If you go through your life trying to ignore your inner life, you will have a less, obviously a less rich experience. That's not to point any fingers and uh, and say, you must <laughs> have a look at your inner life yeah. but but uh, yeah. just bringing it back to that is a, is a nice thing nobody can deny that your inner life is precious absolutely and i think it's for a lot of people you get to a certain point where you can't neglect it anymore it's like prodding at you to be looked at i think yeah it becomes you know they also in the bhagavad gita they talk about how as you from birth until death, that every year that you get older, that life becomes less about the external and becomes more about the internal. That, you know, people, of course, say like, 
Be like, oh, like so and so used to be fun and go out all the time, and now they're just old and boring. Like people say that all the time, or people say that about themselves. But they they're saying that really it's that as you're getting older, you're understanding more and more that life is actually an internal experience. The dissatisfaction at some point stops being about like I feel like when I was in my teens and in my 20s it really was like I can't wait to travel to this place and I'm going to meet this person I'm going to achieve this and it's all out here and you are just loving consuming it's and it's is actually pretty satisfying in the moment but it just doesn't last there's a point at which it really is this weird thing and you turn inward and they say that that's healthy and that as you get closer and closer to death that it's because you are essentially returning home so you return within yourself not outside but i mean bodies inevitably do fall apart and yeah. so it's so important to protect your inner life and find peace as you grow older yeah uh, because you know we we are all going to crumble so the, the the mind becomes the the thing you know you want to you want to try and keep that that peaceful and you're talking about feelings and stuff like that i remember reading so we have the queen in yeah. the uk and yeah. she she was married to this this guy prince philip he's kind yeah. of uh, so he died but anyway i remember him saying uh, this was quite a while ago he was kind of getting annoyed he said all oh, this talk about feelings <laughs> right feelings dumb it's duty duty yeah. matters you know screw the feel. he didn't say <laughs> screw the feeling but you know what i mean screw the feelings duty it's all about duty yeah it's not about duty. How do you know what your duty is right. if you don't know how you feel about something? Feelings are important. Feelings are so important that, yeah. they, um, you know, what you think and feel about a thing is going to direct your actions. And it, sh and it should do. We're not automatons. We're not just doing somebody else's duty. It does seem like feelings have had a global surge in popularity, which is good, which I guess Philip was not happy about, but I, <laughs> I think it's a really good thing. It seems like it seems like, well, I guess for us in this protected lead singer's disease space, we've always <laughs> been indulged in our feelings. Because yeah. right? it's the bread and butter. But I always forget for most people especially uh, cisgendered men the world over, has not been the case, right? Like, that feelings are, are to be ignored for the most part. But it seems like that tide, I think, has turned. I, I'm an optimist. I think this flood of feelings is eventually going to be, has to be a good thing. People acknowledging how they feel, thinking about how they feel, uh, realizing how it affects their life and other people. Of course, this this is a good thing. Yeah. But this coincided with the internet, the age of the internet, the yeah. age of social media. Suddenly, we know how everybody else <laughs> <That's> feels. <funny. laughs> and this is a lot of this is a lot of information. Yeah. And and there's kickback. Right. This is the hidden thing behind a lot of perceived trouble that's going on in the world. Is suddenly we know how you know other people f really feel. Whereas in oh. the past, in the past, they kept things yeah. to themselves, or we just didn't know. What do you think about that transparency? I mean, I would say like even from when, obviously from when the time Voxtrot started, of course, like now the transparency you have as a band or an artist or anybody in social media or doing any kind of press, I feel like is so much more. But also I'm from when Bell and Sebastian started, how do you feel about that transition? Because in the beginning, like I feel like, I don't know if this is true, but as somebody who's a huge fan of your band who was like finding out about it, I guess a few years after it had started, it seemed like there was very little information. There sure. was a lot of mystery around it. No, I, I think, uh, for instance, if Bell and Sebastian started now, we wouldn't start, we wouldn't get going <laughs> because there's all these feelings out there already. <laughs> in a sense, we had a monopoly on a, on certain, <laughs> a certain kind of, we did, in a certain kind of feeling. It yeah. was, they were talking 25 years ago, it wasn't expressed on the internet. Maybe some of the things that I was expressing through songs yeah. maybe hadn't been expressed through songs. And that's a valid thing because when the Beatles did it, they were expressing things through music that hadn't been expressed before. And right. it, it was a revelation. It blew your mind. And then I would say that when the, for instance, when the Smiths came along, you know, yeah. 15, 20 years later, they did the same thing to me. They were expressing uh, feelings that I hadn't thought about. And um, it was nice to have them out there. And you kind of, you 
engaged in that and clung on to that to an extent. Yeah. Uh, you know, not not in a monopolizing, not in a deliberate way, but I had to do it. I had to get these feelings out there yeah. because bad things had happened to me and I had a certain sensibility and it, it all came out in a flood and people engaged in that. And that's the cycle of creativity and engagement that happens. And it moves on. There's many new artists coming up now that are saying things and feeling things that, that maybe would leave us a little bit mystified, but they're being super engaging to, to younger right. people. I guess when I first heard Bell and Sebastian, even without being able to access information about you or about the members in the band, but just pure interface with the music, I definitely thought, oh, here's a guy who's as sensitive and sort of aware as I am. Like it is that kind of feeling like, okay, like there's somebody out there who feels like I do. And uh, yeah, that is a powerful thing. Absolutely. So what's your next move then? You're going to rehearse? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've forgotten all about it. That's true. I'm going to rehearse. I'm going to rehearse. We're going to rehearse for five days. Uh, then the tour doesn't actually start until September. Right. So we rehearse for five days. We go away again. Then we come back, rehearse for probably five more days and just begin. So that, that's it. I don't, but it's a crazy amount of work. Like it's a labor of love for sure. And I mean, it's not charity. So I don't, I don't know if that phrase only applies to that, but it's something I love doing. That is a lot of work, has a huge, I mean, the spiritual reward though is amazing. Like it's pretty, it's just like, kind of moving to go back into your own history, you know, to be sort of like unpacking memories from a box and to see like, oh, wow, like we really built this thing together. But um, yeah, it's just like kind of running the the campaign, which is, of course, mostly driven by social media, but also yeah, trying to think of like creative ways to be putting it back out into the world that we exist. Yeah and to bring the material elements together and get people from out of town to come and practice and to coordinate everything. It's so much, but yeah. I think it's cool. Like it's, it's been already for me about uh, eight months to a year of working on it. Right. Cause I was talking to Evan, our engineer here about how tracking down the physical stuff because we recorded everything on tape almost was its own thing. Like it took so long to find everything and to get, like the other like demos off of hard drives and piece everything together and old uh, photographs and stuff, but it's cool. Yeah. It'll be amazing when we finally get to September 17th to that first date. Can I just, uh, it might be interesting to the people that are listening, just because we've, we've hinted at how when you came to Glasgow yeah. for the first time, can I can I give my impression of when I met you at first? <laughs> yes, because it's kind of funny and I'm terrified. No, I, it's <laughs> funny. It's cute because uh, um, you know I was, a, I think the band was going, and I was a I was maybe like a thirty plus guy, yeah. And um, I had my Glasgow thing down, and I had the little cafe that I used to go to. And Tinderbox. Tinderbox. That's right. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. It was a, it was the, it was the first wave of decent coffee. You know right. that. You know, back in the early two thousands, <laughs> <laughs> where you could actually, where you could actually sit, uh, sit in a coffee shop and not get thrown out. Yeah. You know, because before that in Glasgow, if you, um, well, we had our beloved Grosvenor Cafe, but you had to keep buying food to not get thrown yeah, out yeah, of yeah. that place. That's you know, because it was old fashioned. Um, but so, yeah, we made the transition to Tinderbox. I was sitting in there and you sh showed up or started showing up. And But I think you came to talk to me. That is completely true. And there was no indication that you knew I was in a group, which was nice. We were just two guys having a chat. And I thought, that, wow, this guy looks like a child, but he's uh, <laughs> he's uh, he's chatty and open and it's nice. We had a nice conversation. And in the, in the you know, we were... I was kind of asking you, so, you know, when did you come to Glasgow and what are you doing here? And um, and I, I was thinking, no, oh, this is good. I can impart some information. I can I can speed up a process here because I can remember coming to Glasgow, yeah. uh, you know, moving in from the, the, the suburbs or 30 miles or so. And it took me years to uh, to align myself and find the things and, you know, and maybe feel like I, I belonged. 
And so I thought I could maybe, well, I can maybe help out here. Yeah. And then I said, so you might want to think about there's a place called the 13th Note or this, uh, or this place called Nice and Sleazy. And you were, and you were like, yeah, yeah, I know. I, I, was, <laughs> I was there. And I was like, wow, he, he knows about these places I already. Did my research. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> he's prepared. You know, and, and the weird thing is you, all, you already seem to have these connections that it took me 10 years <laughs> <laughs> in Glasgow. I was like, how, how, does, how, how did this guy do this? <laughs> well, first of all, I'm glad that that's how you remember it because I was thinking like that I was just annoying the hell out of you. Even leading up to this very interview today, like obviously years have passed and I've seen you many times since then. So I wasn't worried about it per se, but I was kind of thinking about it going, God, I must have seemed so embarrassing back then. <laughs> I'm definitely not easily annoyed. <laughs> you, you have to realize that I have a history before that of following bands and individuals around the country and writing letters to them. And, yeah. You know, so. Did it work out well? Um, you know, it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you took what you could get. There, yeah. were, there was some nice people and yeah, it was, it was good. Yeah. And who were, who's one of those people that you... Well, just for instance, I remember, you know, whether I was so mad keen on the Pixies and the Throwing Muses. Yeah. Um, the, and also Sonic Youth and Mud Honey, you know, the sort of bands that when they came into town, I just couldn't get enough. And I was, you know, I'd be working in the record shops. I'd also be, end up roading for them. And, wow. you know, because they, they played the venues that I was working in. Yeah. So I was there. I was like a, <laughs> I was like a, a fly on shit, you know. <laughs> um, they couldn't... Nice. I I was either working in the record shop where they were signing records yeah. or I was sitting on the stage when they were actually playing a gig because yeah. I was the security guy as well. Yeah. And then I was backstage helping them with the laundry and all the time I was, <laughs> you know, asking them questions. And, and then when they, if I couldn't get enough of them, I would follow the tour. I would just take a couple of days off and go like, follow the tour around Scotland or down to wow. England. Um, and they, they, those guys ended up being super nice, you know, yeah. just... I, you know, chatting to, I remember, you know, following the throwing music and it's a band called the Sundays and just, yeah, those guys are all great. Wow. <laughs> that's good to hear. I mean, maybe, maybe that's just the way of a true music lover. Like he's doing, or what's that word? Precocious. Like he's doing this, that, and the other thing is you can tell like the zeal is really there. And I guess like with the music thing, like the fandom can seem embarrassing or something, but I think it's just an indication that the passion is extreme, you know? It's just the, there didn't really seem to be another choice. It was just, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> just feelings, just following your... Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, you wouldn't maybe like to see your, a film of yourself back then. But. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> When our band started years after that, I completely understood the fan experience yeah. uh, and, you know, realized that, you know, if, if there was barriers there, the barriers needed to be broken down. Right. Yeah, that's cool. Did any of those interactions, like, on a logistical level ever contribute to the success of Bell and Sebastian? Was it ever like you gave someone a tape or something and that tr translated to success yeah. none, of, none of that stuff I, I did you know I did you know later on when I started writing I did start dropping tapes and sending letters I even went to I hitchhiked all the way to London uh -huh. to leave a cassette at the flat of Lawrence from a band called Felt oh yeah amazing and uh, I, I in the end I couldn't knock his door I don't know how somebody managed to give me his address yeah I got to the door and I just couldn't knock the door wait Really? Yeah. You didn't. Oh, I guess it's not like the states where you just put it in the mailbox. That, so I didn't leave the tape because I I felt that I sort of failed in a sense because I I wanted to have like uh, the close encounter of the third kind. I actually wanted to meet him. <laughs> yeah. And then when I got there, I realized this was too in intrusive, so I I just turned around. I did leave a tape. I did leave one for. I I, went, I marched up to the radio one desk and left a tape for John Peel, but. Um, but uh, but back then, you know, he didn't get it or, you it know. Just it just went into a yeah, yeah, vortex, pile. but it wasn't, <laughs> uh, but also it wasn't very good, so. <laughs> wow, I can't believe that all the way to Lawrence's door. <laughs> I know, I know, but these are. But it's know. cool, it's cool that it worked out anyway. Yeah. It's cool that that wasn't actually that, that like, that you didn't need to commit that ultimate act of bravery in order for the band. Like, it's cool that it was just like, it just happened on its own. I was a pretty subtle person. I, I didn't 
I didn't really want to be that pushy guy. Yeah. And and so it took longer for the whole band to gestate and everything. Mm-hmm. But that was that was fine because then then it was your time. Then you were ready for it. Yeah, absolutely. But it's fun. We I I really I really hope that Voxtrot gets a, a good that you really enjoy it and you Thank get a you. good you get a good second run at it. Thank you very much. And what it, right before we close here, what so you're in the middle of the tour or the end of the tour? Yeah, right, right, sort of in the middle of the American leg. That's right. Amazing. And, and, uh, oh, and it's is it the whole world? Well, we, we yeah we we go out for five weeks, we come home, and then we go out for three weeks, and we come home. You know that sort of thing. So we will it's been be a long time. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's, it just so happens that the American one is first because the, the European and British ones got postponed because of COVID. Yeah. So we'll be back there like autumn or winter next year and then we're going, hopefully we'll get to South America, etc. So yeah, it's just our get, revving up for a busy time, but I feel the band is up and we're running now, you know? Nice. It's nice. Amazing. Well, I look forward to it tonight. I can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for talking with me. Thank you, Talk House. <laughs> Thanks, Ramesh. Yes. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the TalkHouse podcast, and thanks to Ramesh Srivastava and Stuart Murdoch for chatting. If you like what you heard, please follow TalkHouse on your favorite social channels and check out TalkHouse.com for lots of great written pieces, too. This episode was produced by Myron Kaplan, and the TalkHouse theme is composed and performed by The Range. See you next time. 